I'll spend a bit of time sort of describing what covariance pattern models are. These are a way, a mixed model approach, where you can allow the observations on the same unit to have a pattern of correlations. And I'll try and illustrate this using sort of a matrix format and realise this might not make much sense, but um, I'll briefly describe. This is the um, overall variance, covariance matrix for the error terms, the residuals in the model. So it's basically there's a sort of covariance between each of the observations. And in fact, in here, we've got blocks of covariances. So down the diagonal, these are covariances for observations on the same patient or unit. So we're assuming that those observations repeated over time are going to be correlated. But on the off diagonal, these are correlations between different patients or units. And in this model, we're going to assume that they're uncorrelated. It's the structure of these correlations in here on the same patient over the repeated measurements over time that we're interested in setting a pattern for. So there's various ways that can be done. And these are some examples. So if we so these are the sort of the R blocks from that that matrix. In this sort of hypothetical situation, there are four repeated measurements. So the blocks are four by four. And what they show is the variance down the diagonal for each of the time points. And in this um, structure, this is called a general structure because we're going to have a different covariance for each pair of time points. So we've got different variances down the diagonal. And then on the off diagonal, this is going to be the covariance between time point one and time point two, and then between time point one and time point three and so on. So we've got a different covariance for each pair of time points and a different variance for each time point. So that's a completely general pattern and there it's going to use 10 different parameters. So it potentially could be kind of overkill and but that can be tested whether you really need that number of parameters. One of the simplest approaches is this compound symmetry structure and that's equivalent to fitting patient effects as random and that gives the same variance for each of the time points and a constant covariance or correlation for each pair of time points. So you assume that say you've got four time points there's an equal correlation whether you're looking at time point one and four or time point two and three it's going to be theta regardless. So that's quite a simple structure. Another fairly simple structure is this autoregressive one, and that assumes that the correlations decay exponentially as the visits or the time points become more widely separated. So that can be a useful one too, and that only uses one extra parameter. We've just got this row parameter and the variance term. Um, another one that often is appropriate is known as the turplets. This is, I don't know where the turplets came from, it's probably the name of some statistician, but it's basically a banded structure. So you've got bands of covariances, depending on how widely the visits are separated. So these visits here, that's visit one and two, two and three, and three and four. So they're separated by one, and they're assumed to have a covariance of theta one. And then these ones, theta two, are separated, visits separated by two, that's visits one and three, and two and four. And then theta 3 is the covariance assumed for visits that are separated by 3. So that would be visits 1 and 4. So that's the turplet structure. There's actually a whole load of different structures. Where I won't show them all, but just to give a feel for you can be, you know, there are different possibilities available. Another thing which is quite useful, I've put for treatment groups, but basically for if you've got your groups, whatever the grouping is, it might be treatment, it might be an intervention, it might be uh, different groups of animals or from different genotypes. But you can give them different covariances. So this is just the residual matrix for three, I put patients. You can see they've got different covariance matrices. So that's something else you can do. And quite often it is the case that in more situations than you might imagine, it is the case that groups have different variances and covariances, so it's useful to have the ability to be able to allow for that. So you might think, well, there's all these different covariance patterns, how do I know which one to use? Well, there's various approaches to this. The approach I like to take is to choose a very simple model and then to use significance testing to see if more complex covariance patterns 
have made a significant improvement. And you can test that by comparing something called the likelihood, which is a measure of model fit. You can compare that between two alternative models. So this is something called the likelihood ratio test, which compares this measure, likely, the likelihood, from one model compared to another model. And it will test whether this first model is a significant improvement over the second model. And it's compared, the likelihood ratio test sort of compares the likelihoods, or the log likelihoods, takes the, twice the difference, and it assesses it against a chi-squared distribution. And the number of degrees of freedom is going to be the number of extra parameters in the more complicated model. So that's one way of kind of building up and just making sure that any more complex covariance pattern is appropriate and if it's not significant you might reject it and then you don't sort of run the risk of overfitting and having a lot more parameters than the data really justify. Um, another easier approach that people sometimes use is to get, use a criterion that measures the model fit, but it also takes into account the number of parameters fitted in the model, because the likelihood is always going to be higher if you've got more parameters in the model. So you want to take into account the number of parameters. So this is a very crude way of doing that, known as Ikeke's information criterion. It simply takes the log likelihood, which is a measure of model fit, and it takes off the number of parameters fitted in the model, which is given by Q here. After doing that, it's sort of valid, I don't know if it's really ideal, but it's sort of valid to compare this AIC value directly between different models, regardless of how many parameters they've fitted. But as I say, I would prefer to justify them based on significance tests rather than use this, but you will see this used quite a lot and it's certainly easier than having to go through doing significance tests. <laughs>